Welcome to episode three of the Critical Thinking Tools podcast. Now, this week we're going to be talking about falsifiability. And I must admit, I'm a little bit nervous about this because this, I think, is probably the most important critical thinking tool that is available to help us distinguish between science and pseudoscience. So I feel a lot of pressure on myself to explain it as clearly as I can. It's not easy to explain it, so I'm going to take you through it as best I can and take you through the most clearest writing on this by Karl Popper. The basic idea about falsifiability is the idea that a good scientific theory should be falsifiable. In other words, it should be precisely stated in such a way that there's some conceivable findings that you could find to falsify the theory or to help adjust the theory. So what Karl Popper said in his 1953 lecture at Cambridge, which was later turned into a chapter of a book, and I'll leave you the link to the PDF in the description. The first thing I want to pull out of this article by Popper is this, and I quote, he says, A theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. Irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. Let's go over the words again. A theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. So in other words, it's in the realm of pseudoscience or ideology. It could be a religion or something like that. A good theory is a combination of two things. First of all, it's testable or falsifiable. And secondly, it has been tested many times and it has not yet been falsified Of course, evidence sometimes leads you to change theories. That's true, too. But I just want you to focus on this important tool. And when you come across a theory, is it precise enough so that you can test it? Is there any conceivable outcome that would disprove these sets of ideas? And in general, the more vague a theory, the more theory is couched in terms that are unmeasurable, the more likely that you're going to be in the realm of pseudoscience if the claimant claims that they are creating science, or ideology if the claimant does not claim it's science, you know, for example, with religious ideas or metaphysical ideas. Maybe the person is not even claiming it's science, in which, you, in which case you would call it something like an ideology or a religion or a new, a new religion, something like that. Now, this is not to say that there's no wisdom in non-scientific theories, right? There's probably a lot of wisdom in some of the religious ideas and in maybe in, even in some new religious ideas or new moralistic ideologies. There may be some value and wisdom in them, but they're not science. This is such a wonderful paper by Popper, and it's called Science, Conjectures and Refutations. And it's from a lecture that he gave in 1953 at Peterhouse, Cambridge. And then it was put into the book Conjectures and Refutations for a 1963 publication. So I've highlighted some of this and let's read through some of the wonderful work by Popper here. It really is the highlight for me of 20th century philosophy. Now he starts... Since the autumn of 1919, when I first began to grapple with the problem of when should a theory be ranked as scientific, or is there a criterion for the scientific character or status of a theory? So that's when he started thinking about this in 1919. Now that's an important date in that this was early on and he predicted ahead of time that they might be some problems with these theories. And then 100 years later, we found out that, yes, a lot of these theories created problems that Popper foresaw before a lot of the problems were revealed. He says in the article, after the collapse of the Austrian Empire, there had been a revolution in Austria. The air was full of revolutionary slogans and ideas and new and often wild theories. 
just an aside, this sounds like 2022 as well, doesn't it? So I think there's always these unfalsifiable wild theories being produced in every generation. And this is why these tools are so important. Now, Popper goes on to say, among the theories which interested me was Einstein's theory of relativity was no doubt by far the most important. And three others were Marx's theory of history, Freud's psychoanalysis and Alfred Adler's so-called individual psychology. And then Popper goes on to say further down, we all, the small circle of students to which I belonged, were thrilled with the result of the Eddington's eclipse observations, which in 1919 brought the first important confirmation of Einstein's theory of gravitation. All right, so this is what triggered Popper to start thinking about what is different between Einstein's theory and these other theories that are so popular at the time. He goes on to say later, I found that those of my friends who were admirers of Marx, Freud, and Adler were impressed by a number of points common to these theories, and especially by their apparent explanatory power. These theories appeared to be able to explain practically everything that happened within the fields to which they referred. The study of them seemed to have an effect of an intellectual conversion or revelation, opening your eyes to a new truth hidden from those not yet initiated. Once your eyes were thus opened, you saw confirming instances everywhere. The world was full of verifications of the theory. Whatever happened always confirmed it. Thus, its truth appeared manifest and unbelievers were clearly people who did not want to see the manifest truth, who refused to see it either because it was against their class interest or because of their repressions that were still unanalyzed and crying aloud for treatment." End quote. So he's referring there to Marxism and with repression, he's referring to Freudian. Now he goes on to say a few sentences later, a Marxist could not open a newspaper without finding on every page confirming evidence for his interpretation of history, not only in the news, but also in its presentation, which revealed the class bias of the paper, and especially, of course, in what the paper did not say. Close quote. In other words, Marxists are seeing confirmation of their theory everywhere through the lens that they're using. And then he goes on to say, quote, the Freudian analyst emphasized that their theories were constantly verified by their clinical observations. As for Adler, I was much impressed by a personal experience. Once in 1919, I reported to him a case which to me did not seem particular Adlerian, but he found no difficulty in analyzing the in terms of his theory of inferiority feelings, although he had not even seen the child. Slightly shocked, I asked him how he could be so sure. And then Adler said, because of my thousandfold experience, he replied, whereupon I could not help saying, and with this new case, I suppose, your experience has become thousand and one-fold. Popper goes on to say, what I had in mind was that his previous observations may not have been much sounder than his new observation, that each in its turn had been interpreted in the light of previous experience, and at the same time counted as additional confirmation. And Popper goes on to say, but this meant very little, I reflected, since every conceivable case could be interpreted in light of Adler's theory or equally of Freud's. I may illustrate this by two very different examples of human behavior. That of a man who pushes a child into the water with the intention of drowning the child, and that of a man who sacrifices his life in an attempt to save the child. Each of these two cases can be explained with equal ease in Freudian and in Adlerian terms. According to Freud, the first man suffered from repression, say of some component of his Oedipus complex, while the second man had achieved sublimation. 
According to Adler, the first man suffered from feelings of inferiority, producing perhaps the need to prove himself that he dared to commit some crime, and so did the second man, whose need was to prove to himself that he dared to rescue the child. I could not think of any human behavior which could not be interpreted in terms of either theory. It was precisely this fact that they always fitted, that they always confirmed, which in the eyes of their admirers constituted the strongest argument in favor of these theories. It began to dawn on me that this apparent strength was in fact their weakness. With Einstein's theory, this situation is strikingly different. Take one typical instance, Einstein's prediction, just then confirmed by the findings of the Edison expedition in 1919, Einstein's gravitational theory had led to the result that light must be attracted by heavy bodies, such as the sun, precisely as material bodies were attracted. As a consequence, it could be calculated that light from a distant fixed star whose apparent position was close to the sun would reach the Earth from such a direction that the star would seem to be slightly shifted from the sun. And this is in fact what they found. Popper goes on to say, if observation shows that the predicted effect is definitely absent, then the theory is simply refuted. This is quite different from the situation that I have previously described when it turned out that the theories in question, so he's talking about Freud and Adler and Marx, when it turned out that the theories in question were compatible with the most divergent human behavior, so that it was practically impossible to describe any human behavior that might not be claimed to be a verification of these theories. These considerations led me in the winter of 1919 to 1920 to conclusions which I now reformulate as follows. Number one, it is easy to obtain confirmations or verifications for nearly every theory if we look for confirmations. Number two, confirmations should count only if they are the result of risky predictions. In other words, if you create a experiment that could possibly risk refutation and then you find a confirmation of your theory, that's much more valuable than a study or a piece of research that is designed in such a way that it is not risky to the theory that you're testing. Number three, every good scientific theory is a prohibition. In other words, it forbids certain things to happen. The more a theory forbids, the better it is. Number four, and this is a repeat of what I started with in this podcast, a theory which is not refutable by any conceivable event is non-scientific. Irrefutability is not a virtue of a theory, as people often think, but a vice. Number five, every genuine test of a theory is an attempt to falsify it or to refute it. Testability is falsifiability, but there are degrees of testability. Some theories are more testable, more exposed to refutation than others. They take, as it were, greater risks. Number six, quote, confirming evidence should not count except when it is the result of a genuine test of the theory. And this means that it can be presented as a serious but unsuccessful attempt to falsify the theory. Close quote. Number seven, quote, some genuine testable theories, when found to be false, are still upheld by their admirers. For example, by introducing ad hoc some auxiliary assumption or by reinterpreting the theory ad hoc in such a way that it escapes refutation. Such a procedure is always possible, but it rescues the theory from refutation only at the price of destroying or at least lowering its scientific status. One can sum up all of this by saying that the criterion of the scientific status of a theory is its falsifiability or refutability or testability. Popper goes on to talk in section two of his paper about some examples that he will discuss. He starts out by saying, Einstein's theory of gravitation clearly satisfied the criterion of falsifiability, and then he goes on to talk about some more. He goes on to astrology, and he says, quote, 
Astrology did not pass the test. Astrologists were greatly impressed and misled by what they believed to be confirming evidence, so much so that they were quite unimpressed by any unfavorable evidence. Moreover, by making their interpretations and prophecies sufficiently vague, they were able to explain away anything that might have been a refutation of the theory had the theory and the prophecies been more precise. Close quote. So he's talking about the need for precision in theory. He's hinting that the, the less precise the theory is, the more unfalsifiable it becomes. And he goes on to say, quote, in order to escape falsification, they destroyed the testability of their theory. It is a typical soothsayer's trick to predict things so vaguely that the predictions can hardly fail, that they become irrefutable. Right. So that's what he has to say about astrology. And then he goes on to talk about Marxist theory. Quote, the Marxist theory of history, in spite of the serious efforts of some of its founders and followers, ultimately adopted this soothsaying practice. In some of its earlier formulations, for example, in Marx's analysis of the character of the coming social revolution, their predictions were testable and in fact falsified. Close quote. So what Pop is talking about here is Marx's prediction that in capitalistic countries, the proletariat are going to eventually rise up and have a revolution. Didn't happen in any capitalistic country. What actually did happen is people from the bourgeoisie in uh, Russia, which was not a capitalistic country completely, rose up for the revolution in Russia. So much different to what Marx predicted. Popper goes on to say, quote, Yet instead of accepting the refutations, the followers of Marx reinterpreted both the theory and the evidence in order to make them agree. In this way, they rescued the theory from refutation, but they did so at the price of adopting a device which made it irrefutable. And by this stratagem, they destroyed its much advertised claims to scientific status. And indeed, Marx was claiming to have created a materialistic or a scientific view of socialism. So you might call it a pseudoscience. Similar with Freud. Freud did make some attempts to claim that his work was scientific, and then Popper goes on to discuss those. Quote, the two psychoanalytic theories were in a different class. They were simply not testable, irrefutable. There was no conceivable human behavior that could contradict them. This does not mean Freud and Adler were not seeing things correctly. I personally do not doubt that much of what they say is of considerable importance and may well play its part one day in a psychological science which is testable. But it does mean that those clinical observations which analysts naively believe confirm their theory cannot do this any more than the daily confirmations which astrologers find in their practice. As for Freud's epic of the ego, the superego and the id, no substantially stronger claims to scientific status can be made for it than for Homer's collective stories of Olympus. These theories describe some facts, but in the manner of myths. They contain most interesting psychological suggestions, but not in a testable form. Popper goes on to say, quote, At the same time, I realize that such myths may be developed and become testable, that historically speaking, all, or very nearly all, scientific theories originate from myths and that a myth may contain important anticipations of scientific theories. I thus felt that if a theory is found to be non-scientific or metaphysical, as we might say, it is not therefore found to be unimportant or insignificant or meaningless or nonsensical but it cannot claim to be backed by empirical evidence in the scientific sense, although it may easily be, in some genetic sense, the result of observation. And then very interestingly, Popper goes on to say this in parentheses. There were a great many other theories of this pre-scientific and pseudo-scientific character, some of them, unfortunately, as influential as the Marxist interpretation of history, for example, the racialist interpretation of history, another of those impressive and all-explanatory theories which act 
upon weak minds like revelations. So he's talking about eugenics theory and other race theories of the early 20th century. That's what he's probably referring to. And as you hear Popper talk about some of these theories, you might think about the harm that was done by some of these unfalsifiable theories that are treated by humans as revelations when they come to believe them. And uh, they drive behavior if you come to believe some of these theories too. Popper goes on to say, quote, the problem which I tried to solve by proposing the criterion of falsifiability was neither a problem of meaningfulness or significance, nor a problem of truth or acceptability. It was the problem of drawing the line, as well as this can be done, between the statements or the systems of statements of the empirical sciences and all other statements, whether they are of a religious or a metaphysical character, or simply pseudoscientific. Years later, it must have been in 1928 or 1929, I called this first problem of mine the problem of demarcation. The criterion of falsifiability is a solution to this problem of demarcation, for it says that statements or systems of statements, in order to be ranked as scientific, must be capable of conflicting with possible or conceivable observations. Close quote. So there is the most important part of Popper's really beautiful, aesthetically pleasing article on falsifiability. One of the most beautiful pieces of writing in the philosophy of science that I've ever seen. He then goes on to write about other things uh, later on in the article. It gets less clearer for those who are not experts in philosophy. But I want to stop there in the analysis of Popper's paper and just see if I can finish this podcast by emphasizing how powerful and how wonderful this idea is. I don't think it's perfect. I think there's other tools that you can use in distinguishing science from pseudoscience. But I think this is one of the central ones even today. Notice first how Popper was so predictive of the theories that caused problems later. He was very critical before all the problems of Freudian therapy re-emerging in the 1980s. That's quite predictive, right? So the, this tool is quite predictive of what might turn out to be a pseudoscience or a new religion. Same with Marx. When Popper was putting these ideas together, we did not know of the failures that were to come in the Soviet Union, in the Cultural Revolution in China, and in other areas around the world. Right? So how predictive was Popper of potential problems in Marxist theory? Some of these ideas are potentially dangerous for society if they are presented as science that might increase people's trust in them. But in fact, if they are not science, if they're kind of halfway to an ideology or if they're a pseudoscience, it might be quite damaging to society to believe too religiously in these new ideas. Let me finish with this. I think the most important thing to pull out of this is that this tool of skepticism could save us again and again and again as humans create new unfalsifiable theories, create new ideologies every generation. And this is what I seem to observe, you know, they create new conspiracy theories every generation, don't they? Being able to think through carefully whether what you're hearing about is testable is an important tool. For example, let's say that you get dragged into a social media rabbit hole, let's say, and you notice a belief going around that you realize uh, using your knowledge of falsifiability, you realize that, hey, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't with this new ideology, right? So if you say this, then you're going to be accused of this. But if you say the opposite, you're also going to be accused of this. So it's an unfalsifiable theory that's going on in this little isolated social media bubble that I'm in. I cannot emphasize enough how important this tool of falsifiability is. It's so important to human flourishing as an individual, as you use this to navigate away from pseudoscience so that you can be a successful scientist, perhaps. 
or navigate alternative medicine that doesn't work so for your own health perhaps you can use this tool to avoid conspiracy theories so that you don't look so ridiculous that it hurts your career or it hurts your chance to have a family and i hope you go on to thrive as a result of this podcast and as a result of the introduction to falsifiability